Teachers Book Club. I'm Marlo Artis. The Tar Heel Teachers Book Club is our monthly opportunity to dissect great books. Each month, I'm happily joined by a wonderful panel of North Carolina educators who love dissecting great texts. We'll start our introductions with our friend from Carteret County. Hey everybody, I'm Emily Golightly. I'm a K-5 media coordinator in Carteret County Schools, and you can find me on Twitter at Emily Golightly3. Hello, I'm Kelly Poquette, the 2021 Burroughs Welcome Fund Piedmont Triad Region Teacher of the Year and Music Educator at the Elements Virtual School in Elements County. And please join me on Twitter. I'm at K.A. Poquette. Hello, I'm Pamela Sands. I'm a former middle school media coordinator and current digital learning facilitator in Cumberland County Schools. I'm a two-time winner with both the Cumberland County Schools Media Coordinator of the Year and the North Carolina School Library Media Association's Media Coordinator of the Year. You can find me on Twitter at LivingPamTastic. Good evening, everyone. My name is Arisha Smalls. I am the AIG Program Coordinator for Cumberland County Schools, and you can follow me on Twitter at Smalls Arisha. Hello, I'm Amy Tart. I teach fourth grade ELA and social studies for Clinton City Schools, and you can follow me on Twitter at Cards for Scholars. Great. Our March 2022 Tar Heel Teachers Book Club selection is Beauty Woke by Noniqua Ramos and illustrated by Paola Escobar. Be sure to share your thoughts on Twitter by using our hashtag THT Book Club. Beauty Woke is a stunning picture book about Beauty, a Puerto Rican girl who is loved and admired by her family and community. At first, she's fully aware of their beauty, but as she grows older, she sees how people, that the people that look like her, how they're treated, they're treated badly, so she forgets um, what makes her special until her community bands together to remind her of their beautiful heritage. So where would we like to start with Beauty Woke? The artwork, duh. The cover art, all of the artwork throughout the book, it was beautifully illustrated. It was super colorful. And honestly, it did remind me, like the pictures reminded me, like the colors of the pictures reminded me of books I remember reading as a kid. But the people inside didn't look like me um, or didn't look like this. So I was very happy and excited to see such colorful artwork um, and also be about a, a family of color. I also really loved that they honored Puerto Rican culture with the illustrations. There were all these little nods throughout. Um, on one of the murals, I think it was page 21, they had a number on the graffiti on the wall, and that was how many people have been lost in Hurricane Maria at that point, and you know, the count's still rising. And I just thought that was really powerful to, to have that opportunity to have that conversation with your students and say, you know, that those kids mattered, those people mattered, and you know, still do. And and just to be aware, I think it's easy to forget things as time goes on. You get, you know, the next news cycle and, and things get pushed to the back burner, I guess. So I thought that was really powerful. I agree, Emily. And it was kind of the book was like you're rooted in your family, but grow. And so was, there was always like the nod to the past, but always a lot of looking forward as well. I think a lot of kids can relate to kind of growing up thinking one thing about themselves or even not about themselves, but kind of thinking about like the way they think the world works in that moment when you realize that it isn't what you thought it was, or that maybe, you know, your ideas were a little naive um, and you do kind of get woke to what, what really is going on. And I like how they like, brought it back to celebrate, you know, all of the things that uh, made beauty, make beauty um, special. I always love when a book like does kind of like a nod to like redo a fairy tale. So I think that was one of my fa favorite things about it is, you know, being a retold version of Sleeping Beauty. And I think it's so special that they took, you know, a story like Sleeping Beauty and retold it through the lens of um, the Puerto Rican. And um, I thought that was really neat. That was my favorite part of the book. As soon as I opened, I was like, wait, which fairy tale is this? <laughs> And not just that, like, she wasn't literally asleep, like in Sleeping Beauty, um, but that her awakening was more of a, a reality. Well, and two, speaking of the awakening, I absolutely love that it wasn't tied to some guy coming to rescue her. It was her family and those ties that are forever, you know. I just, I thought that was really powerful, too. I, I love that. 
And that's a lesson for us all as we're facing different situations in the world and people send us different messages, which, you know, she um, experienced different messages and saw different messages and that impacted how she saw herself and how she saw her family. But it was her family that really reminded her of the greatness and what was special and what was unique. And that's what happens with all of us. Hopefully we all have a safe haven that we could be able to cling to whenever we receive those messages that are really counterproductive, that are not true, um, that really are just negative. Where is your solace? Where are you able to really get those true messages? And hopefully it's your family. Did anybody else think about um, the moment in the book where they lay her down and she has her eyes closed and they say the laying on of hands and they're saying all these good things, you know, and then, I akin that to like a baptism, like she went down one way and she came up new, um, eyes open, uh, it's a different world, but she's still, she's aware of what's going on in the world and also appreciative of the new knowledge of, of herself in this new environment. And also maybe a connection, I believe this is an Eastern medicine thing, like Reiki, I'm hoping it's like laying on of hands, like sharing of energy, also not as formal as a baptism, but still like passing on the energy of the, of a community of a person. Well, and on the next page after that page that you were talking about, Arisha, where you see the ancestors and all the little cultural references, and it's kind of, you know, looking back to move forward, that pride and the greatness that came before. And I think that, you know, it was that moment for her that really helped her see that power that maybe she had kind of lost sight of a little bit. Mm -hmm. I loved when Bisa Abuela came on the scene because we, we were introduced to Abuela already. Like she's already there, but then when Bisa Abuela, the great grandmother comes in and I just feel like she stirred the whole house up and got everybody, you know, she got everybody back in line and remember who we are and show her who we are and, I don't know. I really love that part. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. I also liked at the beginning of the book, one of the phrases was keep beauty close. The world ain't woke. And that made me go, ah, that's ouchie. Like for me to think that our children are coming into a world that isn't going to love them. Like all of our children. And then the last page um, that it says beauty was woke. I love how they had different ways of doing the Puerto Rican flag. And that really brought an inclusivity um, into the book. And it wasn't like a in your face kind of thing. It's something that you could use in a classroom and have it just go. But wasn't it cool mm -hmm. though, Kelly, you were saying at the beginning um, about keep beauty close, but I, I thought it was so cool that we got to see the celebration and all the preparation for her arrival where normally like you might see a baby is born like right then you see the moment that they, they're coming into the world, but not all the love and care that is taken before they come. And I think that's so important and it's so relatable that it's real. I mean, we all have taken part in the celebration of life before the baby has gotten here at some point. And I feel like kids need to see that because to them one day they're not here, you know, they weren't here. Mm -hmm. Now they are here. And then that's when their story begins and they don't think about all the care and love that went into bringing them here. I mean, I want to go back to when you're talking about like the laying on the hands and, um, you know, when beauty says, I like, I can finally see, I love the way they referred to her family though. I wanted to make sure I had the right word, the eternal circle of her tribe. Like, you know, the, the people, like you were saying, the ones who are there with you forever and then, like the bonds that just cannot be broken. I thought that was just beautifully stated. It makes me think when you say that, Pam, I immediately thought of legend born. <laughs> and her connections way back generationally. Mm -hmm. Which is on a previous episode of Tar Heel Teachers, if you haven't seen that one yet. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> Shameless plug. But so many different um, connections to previous books that we uh, read because imagine with some of our characters who have really dealt with self-esteem. You know, we could go back to Starfish or Genesis Begins Again. Um, and this is such a celebration of the child and who they are. And you know, as educators, we have to really think about how do we affirm our students? Um, we certainly want their families to affirm them. 
Um, but in some cases, people think that's the job of the family. Like, well, my family, of course, they're going to say good things about me because, you know, they're, they're family members. Whereas educators, you know, the connection that we have is once they join our classroom or our school. Um, but how do we make sure that we affirm them so that they understand that even people who are just connecting with you are able to see the great things that you possess and the beauty that's with inside of you? Because that can really go a long way for kids. And that's why I think I've got to commend the author because the other works are just amazing, like making a conscientious effort to make sure that there are diverse um, picture books. Because I feel like we're getting better about having like diverse characters and like novels, but I feel like it's a little bit slower to see like as many diverse characters in some of these typical, you know, picture books for the younger generation. So I love that that exposure is being given as well at a younger age. That's so good, Amy. And I also think like, okay, great. We're making way for all these diverse characters, but let's not assume that all these diverse characters speak English because yeah. they don't. Can we have their native language mm -hmm. in there with, you know, with the appropriate character? And for me, you know, my kids are in a Spanish immersion program. Um, they're in second grade and I couldn't pronounce all the words in here, but that didn't make me put the book down. Yeah. I tried and then I called for some help. They got me right. And then, you know, I was calling them back and forth. How do you say this? And I would repeat after them. And I feel like that was a moment for us to share in a book. So let's not assume that all of these diverse characters speak English. I agree. And a lot of my students, probably about 50, 60 percent come from Hispanic speaking households. And anytime we have a story or anything that's got Spanish in it, I feel like they just kind of shine a little bit more because suddenly like they're the ones that, you know, they want to have their turn reading then and they can kind of be the experts. So I totally agree. I think it's great to have that outlet as well as a book for those children. Well, and two, I love that the way they represented the language was not putting it italicized like so many books will. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they, they really honored that language and they didn't translate it for you. There's not a glossary. It's, you know, you have to take ownership of that and go find it yourself, educate yourself. And that's really powerful. Um, and I also really like too, that on some of the pages, those little cultural pieces, like the hoop earrings, you know, strong Latina women wearing those hoop earrings and being celebrated for that. Whereas, you know, culturally, sometimes that can be kind of considered not professional, or if you wear your natural hair, that's not considered professional by some people in the business world. And so I appreciated that they threw little nods to things like that to say, you know, that it's, it's fine the way it is. Celebrate who you are. You don't have to be who someone else thinks you need to be, you know? It's almost like normalizing it by not making a big deal about it. That's just, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Even Amy. at such a young age, beauty, beauty was wrestling with whether or not she wanted to wear the earrings or did she want to wear the do-rag, the flag. Like she was wrestling with it because of all of the outside noise coming at her. Um, and I, I, I know that kids wrestle with that. Like, should I wear a shirt that says woke or should I wear a, a shirt that has, you know, something that might be meant to be empowering for them, but then cause others to, to say or think or do things that can be disrespectful. Yeah, it's very challenging whenever you're getting these different messages and kids are trying to grapple with how to just handle it, how to process it because the images are in different spaces. I mean, she's simply just walking and then you're seeing, and I love that, um, that uh, scene where she's kind of walking and she sees all these different things. And it's really things that are in our society and the negativity that people say and no, it's not on a wall somewhere for people just to walk by and see every, in every single community, but it's in the media, it's on television, different messages are going to our kids. And so we really have to look for counter narratives. Like how do we really make sure that the representation is there and that students know whenever there's a big microphone and you have somebody who's saying these nasty negative things, how do we really let our kids know this is not who you are? This is someone who doesn't have a clue, who's just hateful, mean, uh, misinformed, and you cannot internalize that. 
When I think too, like the power in her name, beauty, like from the get go, you know, her family named her that for a reason to instill that in her. And, you know, even though society and the world around her tried to take that away from her, you know, that reminder from her family, you know, this is your name. This is who you are. Um, so I, I love that as well, that that was her name. I was going to ask our question we always ask, what's your favorite character? I think I know who Arisha's is, but I want to hear what, what she says. I was going to say, I already shared, I already shared that I love Bisa Abuela. But yeah, <laughs> she was beautiful. Because it's like, it was like a call and response. And I just really related to that. Um, it wasn't necessarily my grandmother who did that in my family, but my dad. Like if we were feeling down about something, um, he made it a big deal that, that we were Solomon's, which was my maiden name and so much so that when it was time for me to get married i really had a tough time getting giving up my maiden name because it, it meant so much to me um and it felt like it got me through so many things just remembering what it meant to be a solomon but like that's a really that's a real experience that i, I could relate to I actually like the doctor. I know she had a small part um, in the story, but I like that she just set the, the the tone for this family in terms of you have to protect your child at all costs, even from the very get go. I mean, you know, and, and individuals, patients have great connections and relationships with their doctors. If you're very fortunate to have someone who really cares about you. And so for her to even share that with them and kind of give them that that charge, I don't even say it's is set, putting a, a cloud over them. I just think it's giving them a charge to, you have to protect your child and really just be mindful of how the world works. Um, and so I really like that she kind of started the book in that way. I love that perspective, Marlo. I never thought about that, but he, she really did set the tone. Hmm. I am smart, Kelly. <laughs> yes, you are, doctor. The doctor loves the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> And I loved, um, I loved mommy when she saw that something had changed in beauty and she kind of saw those bits of self-doubt, like right away, she was like emergency, gather the family and, you know, and was there and responded to that without having to, like, she just, she just knew that something was going on with her child and how to fix it and how to help her, help her make her feel better. It makes me wonder that if village. other people, oh, go ahead, Arisha. And I was gonna say that's the village you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And that's my favorite character is the community. And how it's just immediate like it's a wrap around. And Pamela, how you were saying that um, the mother knew what was going on. So it made me wonder, did the mother go through the same thing? Did the abuela go through the same thing? Like, is it every generation they went through? I mean, it'd be different. Because the circumstance would be different. But hmm, you're making me think tonight, y'all. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent that's point. Like Probably that. something that she had recognized from her own experiences. I hadn't really thought about that. Mm -hmm. And what do we do when we notice and see our kids starting to shrink or we see starting behaviors where they're doubting themselves? Like how do we really help them to turn the curve? I think that's really, really important for us to think about as the adults um, who we, you know, we know our children, whether it's our students or our own personal children, you know your child. And so you really have to make sure how do you intervene in a way when you see them starting to take on that energy that doesn't belong to them. You know what though, but it's not to instantly smother them. And that doesn't even happen in the book because beauty ends up running off and nobody stops her because they understood that she needed to have a moment alone with her thoughts and her feelings. And of course she's going to come back because she's part of such a supportive community, but they didn't, they called an emergency and they were aware but they let her have her moment and we have to allow kids to have those genuine feelings to deal with their emotions because those are the coping skills that are going to carry them through later when we, when we can't be present for them. That's good. I sense we're going to talk about that in the instructional strategies. I just feel like that's forthcoming. <laughs> yeah, you have that sense. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I will say, you know, when Kelly said the community was her favorite character, I didn't even see it as community. So I, I feel a little silly, but I thought it was her family, you know, and so I'm not sure, but to me, it just seemed like a big boisterous family that, you know, 
a lot of times you have these huge families that they're intergenerational and all that and and that they're just constantly almost on every page surrounding her with love and care and and making sure her needs are met um so i kind of had a similar vibe but to me it was family so and it doesn't really explicitly say i mean i talks about her uncle a little bit and different people but so i mean it's curious i wonder how many of them are like blood relatives and how many are just you know, we're all in this together. We're, we're going to band together regardless, you know, because I had looked at it a different way. So that's interesting. And even within that family slash community, you have a, a very diverse group of people um, banding together. It's not just um, all people from one race or one culture, you know, it's all of the people who are surrounding her and loving her, uh, which I think is really powerful. Uh, certainly, I'm really happy that we have selected uh, Beauty Woke as our book club pick for March. Um, when we return, we're so excited, but we'll have an opportunity to speak with the author of this wonderful, stunning book. Now, Nikwa Ramos joins us after this break. We'll be right back. We are back on the Tar Heel Teachers Book Club, and we're now being joined by Noniqua Ramos, author of Beauty Woke. Noniqua, thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy to be here. It was a beautiful invitation. We're really excited. So please tell us, what was the inspiration for this book? Well, the inspiration came from a, a sort of a, a troubling place because I was feeling quite a bit of despair. Um, and this was coming from um, the treatment of the people of Puerto Rico themselves on the island um, who are suffering from these hurricanes without having um, the resources to help themselves. Um, and the fact that the political situation here um, was constantly targeting people of color, um, whether that was immigrants or whether that was Puerto Ricans trying to get on their feet or whether that was um, you know, roots of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, all of it was converging. And I felt, what can I do about this? It was, it was overwhelming. And, and then I started translating that to how do children feel? If I'm an adult and I'm feeling overwhelmed by what I'm hearing on the news or what I'm personally experiencing, um, what must this be like for a little one? And so um, that's where I started coming up with the idea and started writing. It was a, an effort to, you know, resistance, you know, res resistance is using your voice and Resistance is also providing the kids, the next generation tools to deal with these, these types of situations and to kind of give them the shield that maybe I didn't have or maybe we didn't have growing up to know going right into it, um, how beautiful they are regardless of anything that they're hearing from any sources, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love you. You did that. You provide that shield in such a beautiful way. And it really just reminds us to how we need to affirm our children and make sure that they have that protective layer and just know how great they are just because of who they are. So you so well done. Thank you. Other questions for Naniqua? The question I wanted to ask was, why was the decision made to open the book with the birth of beauty? Oh, I love that question. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so, you know, this is another one of those things where I always hesitate to start because I'm, I'm, I'm in a, a wonderful group right now of educators and teachers, but the reality is when I grew up, the idea of, of pregnancy and birth, when it came to relation to, uh, back then we, I called myself Hispanic, you know, Hispanic people, Latina people, brown, black people was always tinged with this negative point of we shouldn't be having children or we're having too many children or some kind of negative racial connotation. I know I experienced that personally. And even when it was positive, I never saw the kind of celebratory um, nature of birth, of welcoming a child into the world in media represented with specifically people of color and brown and black folk, where it was a huge, beautiful, happy celebration, ushering a child into what was a path and a journey. You know, I saw that most of the time with the dominant culture, with white culture. And so I wanted to contribute to books that automatically teach every kid, the minute that you are exist, the minute that you come to us that light, you are a light. 
period. And so that's something that um, I want them to come into understanding right away and for them to assume for it to be unshakable because the world is gonna shake. There are going to be challenges and I don't want them to ever question that. They may want to question society. They may want to question why these things are happening or what they can do about it, but never themselves. And I also didn't want them to question if something was wrong because I also think that um, many people that I know and myself included have experienced some gaslighting where we thought, did that really happen? Did that really occur? Was I really mistreated in that way? And, and sitting there analyzing it, you know, and training themselves to have faster comebacks and faster responses, you know, it's just, it, and I'm thinking again, wait a minute, what about children? And so I want them to say, wait a minute, I know my, my beauty, my, and I hesitate to use the word worth, but how precious I am, you know? And so any behavior of this nature, any racist behavior, any denigrating behavior, any sexist behavior, that's wrong because it disrespects my beauty and my personhood. In addition to the fact that other kids who may necessarily not be processing that or understanding that, if they see it, they go, oh, somebody's disrespecting my neighbor, my friend, um, you know, all of us in, in the human community, you know, that's the kind of thing I wanted to provide kids with. And we're nowhere near the point where this beauty, this book doesn't serve a purpose, unfortunately, which is a strange thing to say about my own book. I would love, you know, to write a story that has zero percent to do with the heavy issues that actually do get covered, depending on how deep you dig um, into this. But right now, um, you know, even the smallest children are witnesses to what's going on, even if it's secondhand. So that's my answer of why starting with birth. Um, you know, I, I want them to know there's there's no point at which um, they are not amazing, and if I I want to kind of end with this. I always take into account when I'm speaking to children in classes that there may be some kids like me who don't have a two parent household, who may be foster kids who may. And I immediately say this, in, this includes you because the, the, the community extends beyond, which is covered in this book, just the parents that, that, you know, and that can include, I tell them your teachers, all the people that are loving on you are the people who are going to affirm in you that this is truth, you know, and, and every kid deserves that. So that's what I was, that was my intention in starting with birth rather than later on in the story. In addition to the fact that it mirrors the story, but it actually wasn't my reason. It's the one I just explained. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm curious about the language and the way you incorporated the bilingualism so beautifully. Your words really were like a song as I was reading it. And I just read it, I read it multiple times because it just flows so beautifully. So my question is, how do you choose which words you're going to put into Spanish versus English? Was there an intentionality about certain words being chosen for that? I think um, you make me think also of why I choose the, the rhyme and the rhythm of the text. I, I want to mirror the emotional arc. That's kind of what I focus on with, with rhyme, with rhythm and with the language I use. So um, it's where I wanna create emphasis. It's where I also wanna create accessibility. But I, again, I, as you know, I didn't translate everything. Um, but I think that the larger context is really invitational. It, it takes away some fear in that, no, this is an invitation for me to participate fully in the flexibility of language, fully in the fact that we're a global community. We already speak words from other languages quite naturally without stopping. That's always been the case, you know? I mean, I'm someone who used to do middle school Greek and Latin roots and French roots and hey, did you know? Um, but we don't know, hey, did you know that there are Taino words that you naturally use that you're not even aware of? Like, you know, it's just mind blowing to think um, of the positivity of expanding past what we know. I think we we spend so much time being afraid. And I know it is scary. I know that when I enter a room where I'm not comfortable, where it's not my particular culture, I'm a little bit I just like, how do I interact? What do I say? What do I do? What's appropriate? I think we make the assumption that that's only for white people. That is not the case for anyone who's respectful. If I enter another space, I say, oh, how, you know, how can I be the best person I can be in this space and know that everything's not for me, <laughs> right? But then there are some parts where I'm invited into and I want kids to feel, kids who don't speak any Spanish, to feel like there's an invitation. But the secondary uh, part of that is, as you know, there are many kids out there who are Latinx like myself who are not fluent Spanish speakers. We have because suffered from assimilation in our families and the language has been erased, robbed, and so many of us are trying to recover. 
And it's so important that kids feel like I can look, this is, this was not scary. This is a, this was a story and it was just naturally flowing and that's okay. And I picked up some things and I'm, I can participate um, in my culture, you know, in this Spanish culture and, and in, in what's comfortable for me and come into it slowly as, as I'm ready. And I think it's important too, that we do that. So the, all those kinds of things. And I know that sounds like, wow, it would a picture book packs a lot in. Um, that's the nature and the and the and this challenge <laughs> of writing um, a picture book, and I'm so I, I'm I'm so honored to do it because that picture books were the number one passion I had when I started writing a, a long time ago. You met the challenge. I'm, I I can't tell you how honored I am to hear that from all of you educators. That is the heights, and when I'm off of this, I'm, I'm gonna jump up and down, and I'm gonna I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> this is not, you know, this is just calm <laughs> before the celebration. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about um, how the illustrations came to life because the illustrations was absolutely amazing and they just paired so beautifully with your writing. So I kind of wanted to hear more about the process in choosing those images. So I first want to say that an illustrator of Paola Escobar is something I suggest to everyone because her all of her work is just absolutely phenomenal. And when I found out that we did indeed get her to sign on, it was just a huge moment in, in my career because I already admired so much of her work. Um, so, so just that, I'm encouraging kids to do illustrator studies, I think is great. But, um, but as far as this work, this was, um, so my... It's, it's piling up now, but I think that was like my second experience interacting because your mama was my very first experience working with an illustrator. So they were very different with your mama. I did not interact with the illustrator very much at all, other than to say that's okay or final approvals. And I say that to you because it was the opposite with this. So Paula is Colombian. You know, my heritage is Puerto Rican and my background's also from the Bronx. And that's very different from her experience. So I love that you're asking that because this is a good way to bring up to students. Latinidad is not monolithic, N nothing is. Okay, but no, being, just being Latina, um, you know, being, you know, is not, oh, it's all one thing. That's so many countries and that's so many different experiences. And so uh, Paula and I had to talk um, and also we had to translate because she's a primary Spanish speaker and my Spanish is only by writing or only by understanding and listening. So we had to find a way to interact and respect each other. And then in addition to that, I had to send her a lot of information. So the Taino symbols that you see would be some of the stuff that I needed to communicate the importance of in communicating uh, the indigenous roots. And I'm just paging through. Um, I sent her um, pictures of the flags. Um, a study on that is so exciting because why are there so many flags for one place, you know? And making sure, for example, that the um, LGBTQA Puerto Rican flag which does, does exist is was included. Um, and also kind of teasing older students and saying, well, why are some this color? Because it has very much to do with Puerto Rican history and colonization and the independence movement as to why there are different color flags. And then, oh, the other thing, books. So I read through the copy of the uh, book and the final drawings. And I said, you know, <clears throat> there are no books in this house, inside the household itself. And I said, you know, we all, we are all contrary to some people's with huge readers. And I say this to you because that was sort of a accusation levied against Bronx, the Bronx. Well, we don't need bookstores because we don't read anyway. We're like, we've, we've always been reading. <laughs> Whether, we're, whether we have resources or not. And so I said, can we throw in some books in the illustrations that like little Easter eggs that kids may have read. And actually um, another of Paula's books is in a miniature. If you look in the book, you can find it. The Life of, of Pura Belpre is in there. Um, La Pura Kenya is a little mini. So um, it was a, a, a lot of, not a lot of work, but, um, you know, it gets scary to get it right. And you want to make sure you're doing the best job you can at representation. And I honestly tell you, I'm always terrified. So we worked really hard <laughs> to make sure um, that we were working together and creating an experience that was respectful um, and that was representative and that would make it so that a person from the island themselves could look at that and say, they also see themselves, not just the dias diaspora uh, persons like myself. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It was absolutely beautiful. Thank you.
I have a question about, is it okay, Pam, if I go? Is that okay? Thank you kindly. Okay, so you're mentioning like the rhythm and the flow of the of the, the text as you were writing. I'm a music educator, so like I love that. Um, when you're deciding like what words to put on what page, how was that process? Does it, did it naturally just be like, clearly this must happen? Or did that happen in collaboration with the illustrator to figure out which words would go with which illustrations and how you would pace that out? So I, I appreciate your question. You, the questions are so good. <laughs> You're asking me different questions that I normally get. I love it. Um, so I do, I am very musical in how I hear stuff. And, and in fact, it, it can become something where you're talking and I'm starting to hear it like a poem. It's a, just a, <laughs> the way my brain works. Um, but no, I do all the, the, the words first. Now I, I do um, think about what pictures could look like, but just like I tell writers who are asking who are interested in becoming picture book writers I say you have to create an open space for a narrative work that your illustrator is going to layer on there they're going to you, you know you're equal partners in this and sometimes that means we work together and we converse and other times that means you don't but what's happening is you're having an interaction that's happening through the words themselves they are in the raw text just looking at that and saying this is what it inspires that's what you're supposed that's what we want from poetry right we want it to create worlds um so um i do work on separating where i wanted them what page for beauty woke i think it largely stayed in the same spaces where i thought they should be but i should tell you that that doesn't i'm sure that doesn't always happen um, but in the case of these two books and your mama that did happen, I do listen to myself. Um, I do talk to myself to hear what it sounds like. Um, and I do have a, a huge influence in my life. I always have to credit growing up surrounded by um, R&B, jazz and hip hop, because I really always credit growing up in that, that culture to creating the ear that I have when I create words. So I, I always, you know, some people say, oh, you know, these, these origins of great literature, they can be Shakespeare. And, and certainly, you know, that the classic can as its place. But for me, I give my credit to people like Coltrane and I give my ear credit to, you know, all of that. So I, I hope that that answers your question. Those are kind of the influences to create the, 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 the beat. That's great. I love hearing that John Coltrane inspires your writing in, in some way. That's really cool. they've all asked such wonderful questions. I'm almost don't want to ask my question now. <laughs> Here we had, we were talking about like the characters that we, um, we really kind of took to or related to or just really loved in the story. And I was just wondering if there was a character who you have a special connection to, maybe it was based on somebody from your life or just the characters you're writing, you just kind of fell in love with that person. Huh. And in this specific book or just in general? You can be in general. <laughs> hmm. Well, I, I I have to look through here. So first of all, my my father, my papi is a, always a huge influence. He raised me. And so I kind of always, he, he he's always in my mind. And the fact that in your mama, that's who I think of actually, even though it's embodied in a woman. And um, especially with people like myself who may have come from a commute, being raised by a community. I was raised by Thea's and my dad, so aunts. Um, that's what comes, that's what came to mind when I created Your Mama. I was inspired by my babysitter, which is why I always bring that up when I talk to kids. Hey, maybe your caregiver and the person giving you love is that babysitter. My babysitter was a part of my family, even if my dad was at work for however many hours. You know, I tried to bring those dynamics in to recognize all of those kids who haven't felt seen and I know you've heard that before, but I want to extend that um, to just personal experiences. Families are so different and we really need to understand that what's family is love and dedication. You know, that's what family is. So a classroom can become a family. You know, a classroom can become that, that safe, sacred space, maybe for a kid who doesn't have a house, or if they have it, it may not look like what you think it's supposed to look like. So, so that is always in my mind, you know, my, my, uh, father himself was raised, um, he had a, a very, you know, a troubled background where in other words, he was abandoned by his mom and, you know, had to learn to raise himself. So for me, like him being in the background, inspiring characters and kind of thinking, how do I give 
myself as a kid, a book that I needed, how do I give him a book? If I had, you know, him, how did I get, if all of you were sitting in the classroom um, as children, right? And think about what the world was like. You know, I think about what I, what I experienced. I'm like, what could, am I recognizing the adults as much as the kids, if that makes sense? So for me, um, I kind of turned your question around, but it took me to this place. I always think of the caregivers and the the children at the same time. So I always picture the caregiver and the kid on their lap when I write these things. So it's that's, I think, who I mainly have framed what I'm thinking of any of the books um, that I'm making. Um, so yeah, but as far as like a, a, a certain character, the the um, the Abuelita reminds me of my Tia Carmen, who's the major of our family, who's really tough <laughs> and tells you like it is, but you need to hear it. You know what I'm saying? She would be like the Abuelita where she's saying to you culturally, she's saying to you as far as decisions you're making, she's giving you that, that the wisdom that you maybe didn't want to hear, but you need to hear. And she's also part of the reason I sit here today, you know, able to write books. <laughs> that is, answers the question. <laughs> that is fantastic. I have another question. Oh, go ahead, Marlo. Is it a pressing question, Arisha? I want to ask. <laughs> Go ahead, Arisha, you have the last ask, question. If, I don't know if you do or not, but if you use your own children as the test group, what kind of feedback do they give you about your work? So I I don't often use the, I, I do talk to my children um, about the books and I do read it to them, but I don't put them in that position. And I'm not criticizing anybody who does that, really, it's fine. And I know teachers, you know, um, who are writers who test things with their students, you know. Um, I personally like to kind of give them some space from, from that and to just enjoy reading it with them. And this is how I take it. Um, for example, I like to, with Langston, my little one, um, I, I, I got to visit his school and ask him to participate and be an assistant with me and read the book together. See, that's that was the joy. But as far as, you know, and and um, and let him take books to school and share. But as far as like um, running ideas by them, I probably might. That would be Jandi, my older child, who is also very much wants to be a writer. And I might say, what do you think about this? Because I know that I'm out of touch. I have to be, I'm, I'm so much older than the, the, the 13 year olds and what they're thinking and how they're feeling, no matter how progressive I think I am, it doesn't matter. So I might run things by and say, what do you think about this? And they'll give me that perspective. I think overall, um, I like to hear the voices. So my best way of understanding it, and this comes from me being a teacher is just listening to how they are every day um, to me, I'm like, that's the best way that they're in everything I write. And I think I do tell them like, no, there's nothing. It may not be the plot, but that's, that's me listening to the children. That's me teach in the classroom, um, hearing their voices. There's no way that I can make anything authentic without it. And in fact, now as I'm out of the class, I'm back in it because I'm coming back in to teach just in a different capacity. And I love it. And I'm like, I feel so disconnected. So um, again, I hope that I've addressed your question in that I like to soak in and listen rather than particularly target a book. Well, we certainly Thank have you. been soaking in what you have shared this evening and have really enjoyed. So we really appreciate you joining us. Um, so thank you so much for writing this beautiful book, and thank you so much for coming to talk with us about it. To stay up to date with Nonequa's work, please visit NonequaRamos.com. You can also follow Nonequa on Twitter at Nonequa Ramos. When we return, we'll discuss instructional strategies if you want to teach Beauty Woke. We'll be right back. Thank you so much for having me. We are back on the Tar Heel Teachers Book Club, and now we're going to discuss instructional strategies if you want to teach Beauty Walk by Noniqua Ramos. So what ideas do we have in terms of teaching this stunning book? Because I am a person of words, a student of words, a teacher of words, like one of my favorite things, and we talked about this earlier, was the, the Spanish words interspersed throughout um, the text very seamlessly, but without translation in most cases. And like, I love teaching like context clues and like having you figure them out. So I can just imagine a classroom of non-Spanish speaking students 
and taking those in, taking like what is going on in the story and the words that are leading up to that and, you know, trying to, to figure out what those mean without looking it up first and finding it, um, like, I feel like we could have some fun with that. Come up with all kinds of different things that we think are happening, that we think it's saying. I wonder if you could springboard off of that. And I'm thinking of how I have students that may not have Spanish as a first language, but like I've got a family from Pakistan that they may have Farsi as their first language. Is there a way that you could take that and have them write like a, even like a one verse poem or something real simple, not like a whole book and incorporate one word from their language. And it might not even be a different language. Maybe it's just like a cultural slang term that is used that traditionally like you don't write that because that's not like real English. But maybe if that could be worked in and kind of validate that cultural aspect too. And even if you use in the book as a model text, yeah, in that way. Um, with the example that you gave Kelly with the family that or the student that's from, um, you said Pakistan, is that what you said? Yeah, and just almost a retelling, but from a different cultural perspective, integrating a different language. And so really using it as a model text, I think would be cool. Well, and two, I loved the parade and how they were, you know, flying their flags and celebrating all the different cultural pieces. So I could totally see this as a springboard for a classroom or even grade level or school wide cultural parade or fair where they, you know, dig into their culture a little bit, learn more about their heritage and, you know, dress in some of those things, um, bring their flags, maybe even use it with an I am poem and do like a little slam poetry piece or some sort of performance based thing that ties in. Um, I, I just really loved all the different little cultural snippets. And I could see that becoming a whole unit that you could just really dig deep and, and celebrate all those differences. And Emily, along those same lines, for some students, I think it's uncomfortable for them to do digging deep into their ancestry for many, many reasons. Like maybe they're foster, maybe they're adopted, and maybe there's just things they don't know, slavery ancestry, they just don't know where they came from. But maybe they could make a flag that's them, that represents like who they are today, that would have cultural and family influences if that's naturally what they value. But that way, it could be really inclusive, and you wouldn't have to have um, anyone feeling that they're less than. I'm glad you said that because we used to have some teachers that did name projects and the same thing would come up where children didn't know the origin of their name or how their parents picked it. Maybe their parents were no longer in the picture. And so you're exactly right. You know, having different avenues or entry points is really important. One idea that I have that makes me wish that, oh, if I was back in the classroom teaching ELA and if I had a super cool media coordinator, a tag team and do a lesson with, um, I did not know until um, Nonika said about the little Easter eggs, about the book, the small books that were kind of hidden throughout the pages. Now I want to go back and look for them and have the kids create little ones. And because I am a great fan of TikTok, there are, and YouTube, but um, there are uh, like readers out there who are creating smaller versions of the books that they've read and they're putting them in this jar. And so I was thinking about how cool it would be to recreate some of the ones you saw in the book, some of your favorite ones from over the years. And as you read new books, you create these little small versions and when you go to the library, you can just drop them in this jar. And I just feel like then we could say, look how many books Miss Small's class read or whatever. But anyway, I just thought that was so cool. I did not know that. And I'm like mad at myself that I did not catch it on my own. You and me both. And y'all almost lost me because I started flipping through the pages. And then I'm like, oh, wait, we're still <laughs> here. I can't start looking for all the books right now. And Arisha, couldn't you do that? I feel like I'm springboarding on everyone's ideas today. So thank you for having really great ideas yes, that I can you. build on. Um, couldn't you also do that as a classroom too? Like what if you read, a? because so often we read classroom books, right? And couldn't you have like a little one start and then students could add pages to that or work on it together collaboratively? Um, mm -hmm. That'd be fun. I think and it might be a good cool. art, art teacher connection tie-in and they can learn how to make books and that type of thing too. Yeah, that's cool. 
Um, I told y'all at the beginning, I don't know. I'm just a big fan of fairy tales and the different cultural variations of it. And so shout out to, um, it was a blog, the classroom bookshelf, and she was talking about how um, a website, uh, Sherla Loon, I think it's, I'm saying it right. It's like a database of fairy tales and all the different like cultural variations of it. So like letting kids go through there and like pick books that, you know, are relative to their heritage and how them see themselves. So I think that would be a really other great way to go at it um, and kind of as a mentor text to pull other picture books that kind of fit that same theme. Um, and I was thinking April is National Poetry Month and coming up. And so because this is written in verse, Amy just gave me another idea. So I'm going to springboard off of Amy's idea. Um, I was thinking it would be cool to have kids you know, we talked earlier about the the kind of change in perspective when we we thought something was one way and we we realized in reality it was something else. But you could offer kids a choice, like write a, something in verse or in any t- form of poetry that you want about time a time when you had a change in perspective. Or you could take an old fairy tale, you know, that you're familiar with and write your own version of it in verse, um, such as this. Does that apply to the fourth grade? ELA standards of rewriting a fairy tale. Is that right, Amy? Is that the grade level? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Look at the standards. <laughs> I think there are so many opportunities for writing um, or with this book. I was also thinking about um, current events because Beauty watched the news with Tio, her uncle, and then she had feelings and thoughts and emotions about what she was viewing. Um but then giving them opportunity to do a journal entry. And a lot of times when current events are taught in school, we're asking for students to be objective with their summaries, which is a seventh grade standard. (laughs) So right. But um, letting them view a current event and yes, the objective summary is important, but how do you feel about the information? How do you feel about what's happening in the world and give them opportunity to just free write about that? I think that's really good and kind of building from that, also giving them an opportunity to, after expressing how they feel when they're hearing these things that are displayed and, and shared in the media, how do we really help them to create those counter narratives? So there are evidence of what um, is totally contrary to what's in the media. I mean, if we and we always can find a counter narrative. We have these stereotypes about people, but if you really dig deep, you can really find the truth about how people really truly are if you dig on long enough. And that'll be help our children to see themselves in a positive light instead of just totally just taking that negative image and thinking that it's factual. Um, I like you could also, sorry, go ahead. Thanks. About the counter narrative. I, I was just looking at the cover of this book and just how gorgeous the illustrations are. And it makes me think about taking that counter narrative because the media always puts a negative spin on everything, pulling those positives and using that as a springboard for them creating their own kind of self image cover of their their book, you know. Um, I could see them, you know, with the name in the middle of that graffiti bubble and then all of these wonderful things about themselves and maybe even having it be a, a group or partner activity where you're, you know, thinking of things that about that other person as well and, and affirming some things. I could see you really digging in deep with the um, art teacher and doing some neat things with that. And you took the words out of my mouth. So that's a great <laughs> Oh, I was going to say the same thing, getting um, in with the art teacher. Um, I think graffiti can, you know, really be a powerful teaching tool, you know, that, you know, not, not always vandalism, that it can be a very powerful tool for words. Um, so I was going to say the same thing. Great Which would springboard to your music teacher <laughs> who could bring in DJs and MCs and beatboxing and break dancing. So your dance teacher could be involved too, if you have one of those. And with a whole hip hop culture would really apply as well. And you know what, like, I keep, my brain keeps going. Like, I know that sometimes when you all are speaking, you have a certain grade level or kid or class in mind. I do too. And I'm thinking this book is not just for elementary. I would so use this book in middle school, even with the lessons that we're talking about now and how I remember doing um, lessons on graffiti. Um, I think it's a sixth grade short story, War of the Wall. Help me, Marlo. Is Warth Wall sixth grade or seventh grade? Um, 
But and then we talked about Bansky and all of that um, meaningful uh, graffiti. But I think all of those things are awesome and that picture books are not just for elementary students. And to springboard, since that's the word of the evening, mm -hmm. off of what everyone has said recently, I have big in my notes, positivity collages. Um, and I'll, extending that to say that maybe there could be a jar full of positive words and kids could pull one out, not for themselves, but assign it for someone else in the classroom. So you're creating your own positivity, um, your own positivity collage, but giving others an opportunity to contribute to your vision. And that really builds that community. I mean, this, there's so much you can mm -hmm. do with this book. Um, it's so beautiful and it's so affirming. And so we're really happy that we had an opportunity to read Beauty Walk by Noniqua uh, Ramos for our March 2022 book club selection here on the Tar Heel Teachers Book Club. And we want to thank everybody so much for watching. We look forward to seeing you next month.